you have a right in this country to express your opinion, no matter how stupid and wrong-sided it is. Um, and everybody has a right to their opinion. Everybody has a right to their ideas. And the same right that gives wrong people and stupid people the right to be wrong and to be stupid is the same right that we have to tell the truth of the gospel. And um, I wouldn't clamp, but let ideas, and there used to be a time, I guess, when ideas were thrown out there, no matter how wrong or how weird they were, but they are for public consumption, let people hear different ideas. And then people then can decide how idiotic it is or how right it is. I don't have a problem with that. When it comes to the gospel, um, I say, let us tell what Jesus said. Let us tell what God said in his word. Let us tell that in a, in a civilized way. Um, in, in London, there is a park and it's called Piccadilly. And there is a place where people gather and they stand up on a stump or something like that and they give speeches. Just plain common people. Been, been that way for years. And if you're dumb, you'll get heckled. If, you're, if your views and your ideas are not worth anything, then people are going to tell you. But at least you've got the opportunity to tell what you think. Uh, yeah, soapbox. I don't have a problem with, with legitimate speech. I don't have a problem with that. Burning down somebody's business is not speech. It's a crime. It's called arson. And it is terrorism. It is meant, and I want you to understand, there has never been a peaceful communist takeover. Never. That ought to tell you something about how dangerous communism is. Since they can't get their ideas accepted on a rational basis, then their whole idea is to force their ideas by violence and bloodshed and by killing everybody who would oppose it. That's exactly right. They start in Russia. They started with the churches. They bought out the um, the uh, Russian Orthodox church leaders. They bought them out and got them to go along with it in exchange for allowing them to remain open. Uh, but it was that way in Cuba. It was that way in Russia. It was that way in China. It was that way in North Korea. It was that way in Vietnam, and it's that way in literally every place where there is a communist or an attempted communist takeover of a nation, it, they always take over by violence. And um, so that kind of speech is not speech. And any politician who endorses that should be arrested for treason. Amen. Treason. And I think by naming Antifa as it, and I'm, I am going to preach on this this morning, and by naming Antifa as a terrorist organization, that apparently is what's in the mind of the president. Um, and so any creepy, the pervert Joe Biden, the hair sniffer, I mean, you understand why he's decided to pick a woman vice president, don't you? That guy, that guy, listen, uh, Secret Service agents are, co are coming out openly telling what kind of dangerous pervert this man is. He gropes. There was a Christmas party, Secret Service agents. This one agent brought his girlfriend. Biden come up behind her, started groping her. I mean, in front of everybody, because he's Joe. He can do whatever he wants to. And that agent came across the room and they went almost to fisticuffs right there in front of everybody. 
And of course, Biden wants that guy fired and his supervisor didn't fire him because he knew it was justified. That's kind of stuff that this guy does. Um, but anyway, his campaign, he was using campaign money to bail Antifa people out of jail. That ought to be linked in with their terrorism. I think that it may be. I mean, it takes, it takes a while for the wheels of justice. You, ha you have to understand, in the Department of Justice, they've had 20, 30 years of leftist bureaucrats inhabiting the halls of the Department of Justice. So anything that would have been done, like Hillary Clinton's emails, that gets thrown out. That gets thrown out. While they take General Flynn, they trick him into lying, they trick him into it, they threaten his son, and then they accuse him. He's a three-star, 30-year decorated hero of the United States of America, but they accuse him of being an agent for Russia. That's ridiculous. Meanwhile, the same Justice Department says it's okay for Hillary to get off scot-free for killing those guys in Benghazi and then destroying 30-some-odd thousand emails that implicated her in treasonous crimes. That's, kind of That's why it's not easy now to go after these people. They're not all who are in Washington, D.C. They're not all on the same side. So it, it, takes, it takes quite a bit. Um, anyway, Galatians 5. Let's talk about that and then we'll talk about what's wrong uh, with our country. And I'm not going to pull any punches in the message this morning. Because I'm against uh, rebellion. And, and it doesn't matter if it's left-wing rebellion or right-wing rebellion. Uh, I am not in favor of rebellion, and neither is God. And if you will read the scriptures instead of reading the Internet's version of the scriptures, you'll know that. Galatians 5, verse 10. Um, Paul said this in verse 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, uh, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Now, here's something that um, I think stands out in what Paul is saying here. Paul understands that God knows the names of the people in the Galatian churches, and there was multiple ones here. Paul understands that God knows who it was that was spreading the false doctrine in those churches. Understand something. I mean, you ask the question, why do these people get away with it? None of them will. None of them will. Now, they may slip and elude man's judgment. But I promise you, God's judgment is infinitely more severe than man's judgment could ever be. Jeffrey Epstein did not evade judgment by whether he killed himself or someone killed him, which I tend to believe someone killed him. Whether he killed himself or someone killed him, before he actually goes to trial, he did not evade judgment. He is receiving now the wrath of God for eternity. And you need to think along those terms. Nobody will ever get away with anything in God's courtroom. Nobody will. And that's what he's saying here. He says, uh, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment... Whosoever he be, God will take those people. God will deal with them in a way that suits God. He's vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So, verse 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Paul said, I could, I could just remain a Jew and live, live a happy life. I could, I could be the zealot for the law that I used to be, and I could be on the side of all the Jews, and they wouldn't hate me. So if I were to say then, you need to be circumcised like all the Jews are circumcised, then what difference is our doctrine from theirs? None. 
Because if we, if they believe that we keep the law to please God. I say you can't keep the law to please God. And law keeping doesn't please God because our version of law keeping is we get away with as much as we can and be hypocrites, but we still think we're pleasing God. Paul said you're not. So he said, why then am I suffered? Why was I beaten? Why was I nearly killed? Why was I shipwrecked? Out floating in the sea for three days and three nights. Why was I doing all of that and enduring all that for the sake of the cross if you are saved by keeping the law? So verse 12. Here's an interesting verse. I'm, in fact, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to ask you to tell me what you think that means. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. What do you think he means here? How would, you, how would you look at that verse and say, what is Paul wanting here? I would that they were even cut off that trouble you. What do you think he's saying? Get rid of them. Is that what you say? Dave, is that what you say? Get rid of them? Believe it or not, you're in the minority. Because the modern trend, I caught on to this years ago and I'm going, I can't believe they use language like this. Let me show you what the NIV, the New American Standard, and the Christian Standard, which Southern Baptist Bible say. NIV is for these agitators. I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Because he's talking about circumcision. So these, the NIV says, why don't they just go ahead and cut the whole thing off? And Paul's saying, I wish they would do that. New American Standard, I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Christian Standard Bible, I wish those who are disturbing you might also let themselves be mutilated. That is not what it says. And that's not even what it means. So what do you do? You look up the phrase, cut off. Cut off. In the Bible. The Bible then tells you what Paul means. So... Getting back to the plain understanding, what they were in cut off, which, tr which trouble you. Yes, you're right. That means separated out from the rest of the congregation. Jesus said, if thy right hand offend you. So let's say that you had a staph infection in your right hand. And the bacteria was literally eating away your flesh. And that bacteria and that corruption then was spreading up your arm. If antibiotics won't kill it, what's your only option? Cut off the arm. Separate it from the rest of the body so that it does not kill the body. That's what he, that's what he meant. Because I had, yeah, I've had people uh, say Jesus didn't really mean that, did he? Oh, yeah, he did. If you have part of your body with an infection, my dad lost, what, three toes? Because of diabetes. And it was either that or he loses his life. Which is it? Lose the toes. Okay? So that's what he meant by that. And when it comes to those who would bring in false doctrine to a church congregation... The pastor and the people of that church are obligated to make sure that that doctrine is never taught again in that congregation. They have that responsibility to sever them out from the group and say, you can't, you can't say that here. You can't do that here. Um, me personally, I would rather go... If I'm going to preach somewhere, uh, we're talking about setting up a meeting um, in the Buffalo, New York area. And um, we have some followers up there. And there's a church where the pastor, he's interviewed me. He's got a radio show. He's a medical doctor and he's got a radio show and he interviewed me. So they like my work. But if I were to choose, I would rather speak in a neutral place like a meeting room. As opposed to going to a church that I didn't know, I'm not sure what they believe. And I don't want to say anything to that church 
that their pastor would disagree with or their pastor has taught contrary to that, I wouldn't want that kind of confusion. I, I don't think that I'm smarter than every pastor and that church has a right to hear me out. I don't believe that. That pastor has authority over those people and he's got to give an account for what is preached in that church. And so I've ran into this issue before and I told a pastor, look, if, if having me up there at your meeting is going to cause a problem, don't call me up because I don't, I don't want to cause problems. Um, so, I mean, it's, but it's that important. I'm responsible for what is preached in this pulpit. And if something gets preached here that I think is wrong, I can't go along with it. I can't, I can't allow it to continue. Um, so if you look up the phrase, cut off, look at, uh, let me go through some places in the Bible. I call this the cutoffs. Uh, there were times, go to um, Genesis 17, follow along with me in the scriptures, Genesis 17. There are times... When God issued commandments and he said, anybody who does not follow this commandment, they are going to be cut off from your people. In other words, separated out and permanent separation. Um, what's the word I'm looking for when they kick somebody out of a church? Excommunicated. Genesis 17, 14. Genesis 17 is where God renames Abram to Abraham, renames Sarai to Sarah, and along with the new name, he gives him the token of circumcision. And I'll be teaching on that this afternoon, what it represents, uh, because it was done on the eighth day, and we're dealing with Genesis chapter 8. But he gave him the token of the circumcision. And he said, this is to be your seed and all, for out all generations, every person who is of the seed of Abraham is to be circumcised. And he says in verse 14, and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So in other words, if circumcision did not take place, then that man was to be... It's not that he's to be emasculated. That's not what it means. It means he is to be separated out. He is no longer, even though he was born of Abraham and has his genetics in him, he is removed from his people because he chose not to be circumcised. He broke the covenant and the token of the covenant was circumcision. He broke the covenant. Therefore, he is to be cast out. He is not named among God's people, the Jews, because he broke that sign. He broke that token. He broke God's covenant. He breached the contract. Um, if you have somebody, Sterling, that isn't paying rent and they keep not paying rent, um, what do you do? You got to evict them because there are professional squatters. There are people who go from place to place, make promises, they're going to pay rent. Oh, we always pay the rent. Move into your place. Don't pay rent. And they know they're going to be there at least five to six months before you can legally get them out. And they make it a habit of moving every six months and making excuses why they didn't pay. There are people like that. I don't, I don't know how people live like that. You're constantly moving from place to place, beating everybody out of money, and you justify it. I don't understand that kind of thinking. Yeah. And this is why it's, it's gotten to where some of the larger um, companies that lease out apartments and houses and things like that, they want a credit check. We're going to do a credit check. And if we find out you don't pay rent anywhere, you ain't moving in our place. And the stupidity, and I'm going to name 
liberals, and I'm going to main Democrats. Because I'm sick of that bunch. I've had it. I'm not being nice about it. Uh, the Democratic Party has turned anti-America without a doubt. When the mayor of Washington, D.C., complaining to the president that he used National Guard troops to protect her city, and she complains about it and, what, and makes them sleep. They were sleeping out in the street last few nights because she said, I'm not paying their hotel bill and made our soldiers sleep out in the street. That is treason. I'm sick of that stuff. Um, the police union in Los Angeles had a meeting with one of their city councilmen, a uh, Hispanic woman, and told her, how dare you, how dare you turn against us and vote to defund our police organization and the police department in general saying that you can't find the money and yet you sent, what, $25 million to Antifa? They said, we'll remember you when it's election time. Vote every one of them out, I say. Um, anyway, back to the, back to what, I got to stay focused. Uh, but God said he'd cut them off, separate them out. If they, if they break a covenant, then there has to be separation. There has to be separation. Go to Exodus 12. When God gave the feast of unleavened bread and the, and the, um, the Passover, this was a big thing because what God was intending, and I want you to learn the examples here. You say this is in the Old Testament, therefore it does not apply to us. Uh, I say don't be ignorant of what's in the Old Testament because the whole basis of the grace that God gives us and the basis of the New Covenant is the things that he said in the Old Testament. It is the same God and there are expectations that God has out of those that he offers his covenant to. And if they do not meet those certain expectations, I'm not talking about work salvation, but my goodness, Christ died for everybody, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to heaven because Christ died for them. They have to accept and keep his covenant. So he says in Exodus 12, 15, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day shall you put away leaven out of your house. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And God was serious about this. He said, just as the token of circumcision was given to you, now I'm giving you, I'm asking, here's what I'm asking. All I'm asking you is, I'm not asking you to, to starve to death for seven days. I'm not asking you to go and, and um, to injure your body. I'm not, try, I'm not telling you to do anything hard. I'm just telling you, don't eat leavened bread for seven days. Remove leaven out of your house. Can you not do that? And if you won't do that, then you've broken my covenant and you're to be cut off from Israel. And the name Israel is the name given to those who are saved. They are not all of is they are not all Israel who are of Israel, Paul says. And so the name Israel is applied to those who are God separated chosen people. And he asked them, don't have leaven in your house and to, don't eat leavened bread. And if you do that, then you're to be cut off from your people. You couldn't keep something as simple as not eating leavened bread for seven days. And what that shows, and I'm going to use the word, here I can get back into my sermon again. Rebellion. I mean, if God asks you to not eat leavened bread for seven days, and you eat leavened bread, why did you do it? You did it deliberately. You did it because you think you can do it and get away with it. And God just has to wink at your sins and says, it's okay. I'm, I can't be angry at you. That's wrong headed. 
to think that God has to overlook your rebellion and give you a pass on everything when you chose to willfully disobey him. And the idea is willfully. You did it knowing it would violate your covenant. You did it and that's the purpose you did it. And yet you expect God. Um, are there conditions in this country in which an American citizen can forfeit their rights under the Constitution? Yeah, it's called prison. When you're in prison, you have forfeited, because of your crime, you've forfeited certain rights that you have. You don't have a right to privacy in prison. Right? You, you do not have a right to be secure in your effects and, and person while you're in prison. You have forfeited that right. You do not have a right to keep and bear arms while you're in prison. And even afterward, if you've been convicted, uh, convicted as a felon, you do not have an ongoing right to... Let me tell you something. You know what they're wanting to do? These liberal dims are wanting to give those who have been convicted of felonies, they want to give them their right to firearms back after they get out of prison. Now, understand, if you think they're stupid, they're not. They're crazy like a fox. They understand that they can't win in honest ways. The only way they know they can win is to completely destroy American life the way it is now. And they, so you have to, you have to hire gangs and thugs and terrorists to do your dirty work. And any black person who thinks the liberal Democrats are on your side, you are fooled. They are using you as a pawn in their game for political power. But if you think they care anything about you, you're wrong. When Hillary embraces the uh, founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, who basically started Planned Parenthood because she thought there were too many blacks and Hispanics in our cities and her goal was to keep them from populating and breeding. So she said, let's kill their babies because there's too many of them. And Hillary Clinton said, Margaret Sanger is my hero. If you think these people are on your side, you're, you're wrong. You've been lied to and you, you believe the lies. Anyway, moving, moving right along, Exodus 30, turn there. I might as well just get up here and preach. Exodus 30. Verse 31. Thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be in holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. God had given them in Exodus 30 a compound, a way to take certain spices and certain fragrances and compound them together and to make an anointing oil. And the oil then was to be poured over the head of the high priest. And it was a certain mixture. And it was, God had made this public, he wrote it down in his word, this is how it's to be. Come on in, Ray. God said, this is how it's to be. I'm surprised I remembered your name. Hey, amen. But anyway, uh, God gave them the ingredients and the instructions on how to compound this anointing oil. And it was, it was a very peculiar fragrance. Now think New Testament. Think what Paul said. Paul said, we are a saver unto the world to those who love life we're a savor of life but to those who love death we're a savor of death unto them in other words 
God's saying that we as Bible believers are unique and we are different from the rest of this world. We're going to be judged differently, by the way. We're judged on our faith and lost people are judged on their works. That's made clear in Revelation 20. They are judged by their works and they're judged by the things that are written in their books. So God says that we are a peculiar people and we have a a peculiar fragrance to this world. So he says here in Exodus 30, I mean, it may seem an extreme thing. God says, if you smell a certain way, I'll cut you off from my people. Well, he meant this and here's the meaning behind it. He says there in, in verse 32, upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Neither shall you make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger shall even be cut off from his people. God said you will be kicked out from the congregation of your people for compounding this on your own or anointing yourself with it, or anointing a stranger with it. God said, and I mean, it's obvious. We recognize smells easily, okay? And I mean, I know what my wife smells like, which is good, okay? So, I don't want anybody else smelling like my wife. And and Lisa knows what I smell like, and she doesn't want anybody else's smell on her husband, I guarantee you that. So it's the same idea. God says, if I smell this on anybody else, I'm going to cut you off because this ointment and this oil is reserved for the high priest. It's reserved for a peculiar people. In verse 38, whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. And it's the idea that just because there are people sitting in church pews this morning, that doesn't mean that they are part of the body of Jesus Christ. And what they're doing is they're attempting to be like God's peculiar people. But God says, they're not my people. I've cut them off for even attempting to be like the savor of my peculiar people. God says, I've cut them off for that. I've separated them out. They are not part of the congregation and their name will not be written in the book of the congregation of my people. Their name is not written in the book of life. God said, I'll cut them off. That, and that's what that phrase meant. Not cut body parts off, not cut your man parts off, not emasculate yourself. He did, Paul did not say that. He meant literally separating them out from the congregation and they're not part of his people. In Exodus 31, God said, you shall keep the Sabbath. Verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. And I think in uh, Exodus, I think it's Exodus 31. Maybe not. Um... There was a story, I had this, I saw it last night, I didn't put it in my notes, but there's a story where they found someone gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. Are you kidding me? Just gathering sticks? You mean God was serious about this commandment? Of course he was. God said, if you want sticks gathered, gather them on the sixth day. If you want manna for the Sabbath day, I'll give you double on the sixth day. I'll give you a double portion. You gather it then, but I don't want you out gathering on the Sabbath day. And anybody who went out on the Sabbath day to gather the manna, God strike them dead. Because he was serious about this. And you cut him off. And so they found one gathering sticks and they brought him in and they stoned him with stones. God was serious about his laws and his commandments. And those who were willing to keep those commandments, 
it would be in their heart. And they would say, you know what? It's the Sabbath. I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to do these things. It's the Sabbath. This is our day where God gave us to rest. I'm going to honor that. I may not understand it, but I'm going to honor it. And you're not going to see me out gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. So those whose heart was right toward God didn't have a problem with these things. It was those who were rebellious. Those who were rebellious against God's commandments and against God's statutes and God's covenant. And it's like I said, there are people who will sign agreements. They don't have a problem signing contracts. They sign contracts all the time. They have absolutely no intention of keeping any of those agreements. They are traitors. They are covenant breakers, truce breakers, the Bible says. And they have a rebellious attitude. Uh, Leviticus 7, 27, whosoever shall, uh, whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. That then is displayed in the four things that the Gentiles were told in Acts chapter 15, when they had the Jerusalem council and they were, they were saying, now should the Gentiles, should they be circumcised and keep the, keep the laws as we Jews? And they said, we Jews didn't keep the law. So why should we make the Gentiles try to keep it? So they said, okay, but we, we're going to give them at least four things. Number one, abstain from fornication. Number two, abstain from eating things sacrificed to idols. Number three, don't eat something that was strangled. And number four, don't eat blood. Do not consume blood. I don't think you ought to eat blood sausage. Okay? God said don't do it. Now some say that means don't eat your steak rare. That to me, that doesn't count. The blood's going to be in the meat, no matter if it's rare, you cook it. I mean, there's a certain amount of blood in muscle tissue that has to be there. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that counts. But anyway, these are rules that God laid down, and, he, and I've got a bunch more. You know me. Uh, Leviticus 18, very quickly, I've got to read this one. Whosoever should commit any of these abominations. And Leviticus 18 is about all kinds of perversion. Sleeping with your mother-in-law, sleeping with your father, uncovering your father's nakedness, sleeping with your daughters, uh, sleeping with uh, just committing fornication of any kind. That was all in including, I don't need a law for this, but apparently some people do, lying with beasts. You don't have to have a law. I don't have to have a law enforcement tell me not to do that. Ugh. But some people do. So God said, anybody who does this, they should be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall you keep mine ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you. In other words, the Canaanites were doing those things. This is why I'm kicking them out of the land and I'm letting you live in it. If you do these things, I'll kick you out of the land as well. This land is going to be holy. And we know that that land was a picture of heaven. And God says these abominations are not going to be found in heaven. So anybody who's doing these things, if you think you're going to go to heaven, like in Islam, if you think you're going to go to heaven, commit fornication with 72 virgins chained to a couch, you're crazy. And God said to be cut off. You're not going to defile my name and my covenant and my law among your people. I'll cut you off. And God knows how to do it. Let's bow our heads. Father, I ask you for your blessing, for your help this morning. My, my mind is full. My emotions are running high this morning because of what I see going on in my country. It's not right. I know it's not right. And it needs to be spoken that it's not right. And Father, we are starting to see the extreme abominations that exist in our country. And Father, I don't know that any one man or group of men have the power or even the strength or the will to eliminate that kind of evil out of our land. Father, you do. And we appeal to you, God, as the righteous judge. And we ask, dear God, that you judge this country. 
And Father, let judgment then, if you're going to judge his country, we understand that judgment must begin at the house of God first. So Father, I ask you, God, to judge all the churches. Any church, God, that stands up for wickedness, abominations, rebellion, sedition, ungodliness, Father, they should be judged. We also, Father, judge us as well. That our heart's right, our motives are right, our heart is pure. And Father, we ask you to judge our country and get rid of the evildoers out of the midst of it. Father, we want a place to raise our families a place, dear God, to teach our children your ways and our grandchildren. And Father, we are in fear that those days will soon be gone. So Father, we pray, dear God, that you would hear our prayers this morning. Guide us in our thoughts, Father. Guide us with your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.